All right, well, last time we saw uh, God promising Abram a great reward. And uh, Abram basically says, you know, what's that matter? You know, I have no child to pass the reward on to. You know, he says, don't get me wrong, rewards are great, but I already have everything I need except a child. And uh, God took him outside and he said, now look towards the heavens and, and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Abram believed God, uh, but he wanted a receipt. You remember, he, he wanted something that would bind the deal. And, and so God made a covenant with Abram, a one-sided covenant. It, it was a contract, an agreement that only required God to do something. Uh, for this deal to be completed, Abram had to do nothing. Uh, for this, uh, There was no stipulation in the contract uh, that, that Abram had to uphold. Absolutely nothing was required from Abram. And you know, the new covenant, the covenant that God has made with us uh, for our eternal salvation is the same way. It's one-sided. God did it all. Uh, all we do is agree with it. We just accept it. Uh, our performance has no bearing whatsoever on God holding up his end of the deal. Uh, in fact, he's already done his part. He's already paid the price. It's complete. It's finished. And uh, if you have accepted it, if you have believed it, uh, then you've already been adopted as a son or, or daughter of God. Uh, you've already been given citizenship in the kingdom of uh, heaven. It's all done. All the paperwork's been filed. Your name's already been written, you know, into the in the permanent document, into the book of life. It's a done deal. And sometimes it's hard for us to accept that, isn't it? Uh, but it's the truth. There's no earning a gift. If you do something to earn it, then it's not a gift. It's a wage. And the only way eternal life... Uh, is through the gift of God. The only way to heaven is through this gift of God, by the grace of God, by God's unearned favor. That's how we're saved. Uh, sometimes we still think we need to help God out. We, we think we need to throw our two cents in. You know, God has paid uh, more than whatever, billions of trillions of dollars, let's say, and we still want to put our two cents in, you know, and try to try to make the bill trillions of billions of dollars and two cents. And it's kind of silly, isn't it? Because when we do that, we begin to think that we helped pay for our own salvation, uh, which is a lie. And it leads to pride and it leads to this self-exaltation uh, and, and it leads to us putting expectations on others, uh, you know, too, so that they can help pay for their salvation uh, by their works. Uh, so they can too, they too can a attempt to diminish the price that God actually paid. And, uh, you know, if you, if you have that attitude that, that you ain't no charity case, then, then you're really not saved or you certainly don't understand salvation and the grace of God. Because that's exactly what salvation is. It's, it's a case of God's charity. It's a case of God's love poured out on us. It's 100% gift, 100% grace, 100% love. 100% charity, 100% God doing it all and us doing absolutely nothing. And uh, do those sounds like terms that, that you know, we would be willing to agree to? Well, I hope so, right? There's no neg negotiation on this. Those are the terms. God does it all because God does it perfect. And for us to be saved, uh, for us to be in his presence, perfection is required. And anything we would add to it would make it less than perfect. And uh, that doesn't mean God doesn't want to use us. He, he does want to use us. He really, really, really wants to use us, but not to save people. God saves them. Uh, he will use us to introduce people to Jesus. Uh, and he wants to use us for that. And he wants us to play a role in that, a big role in that. But he does the saving part. He does the salvation part. That part's all his. He paid the whole bill. It's up to him. So this covenant uh, that God had, had made with Abram, that he'd be a father, and, and so, of course, this covenant was extended to Abram's wife, Sarai. Uh, this pregnancy would require two people. And since God talks uh, about a man and a woman coming together and, and being joined into one, God joining them together, and remember, he forbids man to separate this union of marriage, uh, this union of the two that have become one, 
Uh, well, Abram and Sarai, they've been married for quite some time now. And, and this is a lifetime partnership, just as God intends for every marriage. Uh, unfortunately, man tends uh, to get involved sometimes and, and cause this separation, which I, I think is about 50% of the time these days. Well, so God promised that he would give this couple a child to pass on the family name and the bloodline, which, which would extend into this great nation of people. And this covenant was one-sided. It was signed and sealed by God alone. God alone passed between the sacrificed animal halves, you remember. And it was completely dependent upon God. It required nothing from Abram or Sarai. And that brings us to chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, now behold, the Lord has prevented me from, have, from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. After Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar, Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. So they'd been in the land uh, 10 years now. And Abram is 85 years old, 85 years old. Sarai is 75 years old or about there. And uh, so she's been barren to her knowledge, what, like 55 or 60 years or so that, you know, that she's experienced nothing happening in that department. And, and so it's understandable to me that, that she would begin to question, you know, that she would begin to doubt. You know, did God really speak to Abram? Did God really pass through the, the sacrificed animal halves? You know, I, I remember it being hot out that day. You know, I remember Abram had been out in the sun all day and maybe he stumbled across another patch of those crazy mushrooms or something, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, how, how our minds work. And, and so Sarai decides that she's going to put her two cents in on the deal. She concludes that God needs a little help keeping his promise and, uh, you know, I, and I mean, they're, they're getting old. She's 75. OK. And so if it happened right now, right then, she would still be what, like 90, 91 years old, uh, riding in the passenger seat of the chariot when her 15 year old gets his driver's permit. Right. And so uh, and they didn't have pacemakers to really keep that old heart ticking there. So it's uh, she's getting up there. And so what, is she going to wait another 10 years and then be a, a hundred years old with a teenager in the house? And I mean, that's, it's, it's crazy, right? So Sarai, who is apparently way ahead of her time, she invents this uh, surrogate motherhood idea without the test tubes, of course, they didn't have those yet. So Sarai's thinking, I'll, I'll have this maid servant that is under my authority. I basically own her, uh, so to speak. And if so, if she were to have a baby, then I would own the baby as well. And uh, God did say that the child would come from Abram's own body, but he didn't really specify my body, right? He wasn't that specific. So he must have known I was going to come up with this awesome uh, idea to get myself a baby. And uh, <clears throat> Abram, Abram will just have to take one for the team and impregnate this much younger woman. And uh, so... The baby will have Abram's handsome features, you know, his good looks, and, and maybe Hagar's hair. You know, she has such pretty hair. And uh, I hear it's because she rarely washes it, you know. So, <laughs> so uh, she has this foolproof plan to help God keep his promise and to get the baby that she's always wanted. And it'll be a blood de- descendant of Abram to pass on the family name. I mean, it's like a win-win-win situation, right? Her only problem is, well, how is she going to convince Abram uh, to go into this, you know, with this much younger woman with, with the nice hair? You know, I mean, I don't, she could have been bald. I don't know. I don't know what her hair is like. But, but uh, so how is she going to convince Abram to go along with this plan? You know, uh, laying with, with another woman. Uh, with his wife's permission. And, uh, you know, I kind of say this jokingly because we know it probably, it probably didn't take much convincing. But, you know, it should have. It should have. I mean, the thought of this should have been appalling to Abram. 
Uh, he should have been disgusted <clears throat> at even the thought of such a, an atrocious act against the sanctity of his marriage. And uh, But because Abram and, and all of us were housed in these wretched sinful bodies uh, with their disgusting sinful natures, <clears throat> we know, sadly, that it didn't take much convincing. You know, the, the right response to this suggestion from Sarai, the, the right response from her husband should have been, you know, Sarai, Sarai, I know you want to have a baby. I know you want to have a baby on your own. I do too. I want to have a baby too. But this isn't the way. This isn't the way. I love you too much to bring another woman into our marriage bed. I love you way too much for that. And if we can't have our own baby together, then we'll do something else. We'll adopt one. And it'll still be our child, and it won't matter that it didn't come from either one of us. And maybe it can still come from Hagar, you know, if she, if she gets her own husband, and, and it would have the hair, you know, that you want so much. And, yeah. and uh, I never really took notice of her hair, because your hair is so beautiful, Sarah. You know, and, and, uh, and, and Abram still believing that God would honor this promise. And really, this is the type of response that Abram should have given. And this is the type of response that every one of us should be giving in these kind of situations. But because of our disgusting, sinful natures, because our wretched old man that we continue to pull up out of the grave, because of our lack of faith uh, in God to provide all that we need, our, our lack of belief that the old man is conquered and did because of what Christ did on the cross, because of all that, most of us, including Abram, won't give the right type of response in this situation, or quite often. And, and it's really sad. It's really sad. I mean, sin, uh, it's just an awful thing. It's an awful thing, isn't it? It's a horrible thing. Well, that brings us to verse 4. And it says, He went in to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived... Her mistress was despised in her sight. So not only has the marriage bed been defiled here, but, but Sarai, she'll always wonder, you know, did, did he enjoy being with her? You know what I mean? He, he had to enjoy it to a certain degree just because of the mechanics of it there. But, but did he like being with that woman more than me? You know, always looking at him, always wondering. Uh, what is he really thinking, you know, and, and, and now possibly insecure. And, and if he did it once, would, it, would he do it again? And, and she's so much younger and, I, and I'm older. You know, why wouldn't Abram just marry her and then the two of them could raise the baby together? And I would be the old maid, you know, what have I done? And, and so now Hagar, she's playing it up. Uh, she's got her some attitude, we see. And, uh, you know, I can just envision her, you know, uh, look what I was able to do uh, with your husband. That, that little thing that you've been trying to do for over 50 years now. Yep, I did it, you know. I've had that, I have that pregnant glow and it really makes my hair look great, don't you think? And, and uh, I don't think I'm going to be serving you anymore. After all, you know, I'm the pregnant one in this house. And we don't want anything to happen to this little precious baby that's in my womb, right? And uh, so in verse 5, And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be upon you. I gave my maid to your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. And Abram is like, you know, whoa, 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 time out here. Uh, you're the one that suggested this wonderful idea, forcing me to perform with this servant girl and like I'm some sort of breeding animal, you know. No, no, no. You're the owner of this experiment in animal husbandry. Now, now that it's gone horribly wrong, somehow it's all my fault, you know. And uh, But it is Abram's fault, isn't it? Because he's the spiritual leader of the family. And uh, if he would have responded properly to her suggestion, uh, then they would be in an awesome place in their marriage right now. But he didn't, and they're not. And, and now he's in between a rock and a hard place. Uh, uh, what, 
what was imagined as this win-win situation has now turned out to be a lose-lose situation. On one hand, he's got this unborn child to protect and care for that happens to be in Hagar. And on the other hand, he has his wife that he loves and he has to protect and care for. And, you know, traditionally, by taking care of your wife, you're taking care of the baby. But Abram has a decision to make, and he needs some wisdom. But forgoing God's wisdom is what got him in this mess to begin with. Uh, By not taking charge, by not following God's leading and trusting in God's promise, he ended up in this mess. And and now he again fails to take responsibility for the situation. And he passes it on to his wife, who rightly so is in no condition to make a wise decision concerning this matter because she's been emotionally taunted by Hagar. And so... uh, The wisdom just isn't there when when we're under those conditions. So verse 6 says, But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarai treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence. So Abram refuses to take responsibility for the situation. And instead of taking you know, talking with Hagar and, and reminding her of her place in the household and, and how she needed to drop the attitude and respect Sarai, you know, who's basically her boss, and, and maybe explain how tough this situation is on Sarai. And, and you know, she's in this fragile place and just ask Hagar to, to try and be peaceful in this in the house, not divisive. But no, Abram says, hey, she's your servant. You're the boss. Do whatever you want with her. You take care of it. Again, not really good advice concerning the situation. So Sarai has permission to treat Hagar however she wants, you know. And, uh, you know, I can hear her now. Oh, uh, Miss Hagar, you like a little attitude, do you? Uh, I'll show you some attitude. You know, get your, get your fat, lazy rear in the bathroom and clean it. And when you're, when you're done with that, I got a list a mile long for you, Missy. And by the way, are you sure you're pregnant? Because you just kind of look fat to me. You know, I hate to mention it. But, and uh, I don't know what she said. but uh, And so Hagar, she runs away. She runs away from home uh, with the baby of Abram in her womb. And Sarai is glad to see her go, but not the baby. You know, she's not, she's not glad to see the baby go. And, and what will happen to her out there? I mean, where will she go? What will become of a pregnant service servant girl all by herself in a strange town? You know, it doesn't look good. The situation, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And, uh, and now, you know, it all started with Sarai just trying to help God out, just wanting to throw her two cents in. Uh, but you see, God's plan for our life, it, it's absolutely perfect. And any change in that plan by us, it's going to be less than perfect. It can't be better than God's plan. It's going to be worse. And that's less than perfect. And this change here that Sarai and Abram made is a lot less than perfect, we see. I mean, it's a perfect mess is what it is. And so now, what are they going to do? Did they finally call upon the Lord? You know, maybe we're not sure. We're not told. But nonetheless... You know, God feels it's time to step in here. He feels it's time to step in and to try and make the best of this bad situation. And that is, and that's exactly what God does. I mean, no matter how bad we mess up, no matter how less than perfect we make the situation, God will make the best of it. Now, it won't be perfect in the sense that the original plan was perfect. But it will be the perfect answer to a bad situation. It'll be the best possible solution. There will still be consequences, but they'll be managed in the best possible way when we hand it over to God, when we look to him uh, for the answers. So verse 7 says, Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, Where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. So God certainly recognizes that this is an emotional situation. And so to help her out, to to help her get her bearings straight, he asks her a couple of questions. 
you know, that God already knew the answer to. And, and Hagar knows the answer. But she's really not thinking about that right now. She's upset. She's emotional. She's mad that Sarai got her into this situation to begin with. I mean, Hagar got pregnant just like Sarai wanted. And now she gets rewarded by being treated horribly. And uh, so here she is in the wilderness, out in the desert, and uh, and she finds a water, a spring of water. So that's good. She won't dehydrate, but I'm sure she has nothing to eat and she's eating for two. And so that's not good. And so God says to Hagar through this angel of the Lord, he asks her, <clears throat> where did you come from and where are you going? And Hagar says, well, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. You know, and it's to get the wheels turning there. You know, uh, if she's my mistress, then I'm her servant, right? And I'm not really serving her very well out here in the desert, am I? And, uh, you know, she's probably thinking, well, she's taken such good care of me over the years. And, and it was all great until that stupid man messed up everything, you know. And, and, uh, and that's, that's what I left behind. Where am I going? You know, she may have not thought about that. Well, I don't know. I mean, where can I go? And so in verse nine, it says, then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will they will be too many to count. The angel of the Lord said to her further, behold, you are with child and you will bear a son. And you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live to the east of all his brothers. And so God says, there's nowhere else to go. It's a bad situation, but the best solution is going back, going back to where you belong, submitting yourself to Sarai. Now, Hagar was was being horribly mistreated by her employer, I guess to say. Uh, and so what kind of advice do you think she would have received today, you know, with the counselors today? You know, girl, you've got one heck of a lawsuit building here, you know, and and uh, the state needs to make an example of this employer. employer. We're going to we're going to throw the book at him, you know, the one call, that's all, right? And uh but God knows better. God knows that when Hagar submits herself, uh, the haughtiness will be gone and Sarai will begin to treat her better. And, and, you know, this is a huge truth of God. When in a contentious or divisive situation, humility will diffuse it. Pride or ego is what is what makes us butt heads. Humility will diffuse it. Uh, it, it, it if, if one person just humbles himself, uh, it, it adds peace to the situation. It, you, you can't argue with someone if they don't argue back. It kind of turns it from an argument to a speech or a lecture, you know, or a sermon, I guess, right? And so humility, it always adds peace or calmness to the situation. So God now makes Hagar uh, a, a promise that she would have many descendants through this baby, uh, then God does the, like a supernatural ultrasound, I guess, on her. And, and he says that she will have a boy. And uh, then God picks the name. He says, you're going to call this baby Ishmael. And uh, this is the first time that a person was named before they're born that we see in Scripture. And uh, apparently the sex of the baby was not the only thing that God found out with this supernatural ultrasound. God says, he will be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. I mean, just what a mother wants to hear, right? Your son will be a wild donkey of a man. I mean, could you imagine? I mean, just, a, a plain donkey is bad enough. They're so stubborn. But a wild donkey? And, uh, of course, that could make the handoff of the baby to Sarah, you know, a little easier, right? You know, here he is. He's all yours. Little Jack Donkey, I mean, Ishmael, you know. And so, uh, and it says his hand will be against everyone. And, you know, Ishmael is the father of the Arab race. And his half-brother Isaac, who's going to come later on, he's the father of the Jewish race. And so, uh, are the descendants of Abram and Isaac 
still suffering the consequences of Sarai and Abram trying to help God out by throwing their two cents in? Isn't that crazy? This, this feud that we see today between Israel and the Arab nations, it goes back some 4,000 years. 4,000 years this goes back to. And uh, they would have never imagined that, right? And, uh, and it's going to take, I mean, you know, they're always asking for peace there, but, but, but we know it's going to take the Antichrist uh, that's going to give them this false peace, but it'll ultimately take Jesus Christ himself ruling and reigning on earth. Uh, to have a real peace there. Then in verse 13 it says, Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God who sees. For she said, I have even remained alive here after seeing him. Therefore the well was called Ber Lahoi Roy. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. So Hagar calls God El Roy, or the God who sees, or supernatural ultrasound. Uh, That's what I would say, because he saw what was going on, right? And so obviously... She follows the Lord's direction here. Finally, someone does, right? And she returns home, and she has the baby, and he's named Ishmael. And Abram, who's 86 years old, uh, has a newborn child in the house. Can you imagine? But but it works out because at 86, I'm sure he's up four times a night using the bathroom anyway. And so <laughs> just throw the bottle in the microwave and do it all together. And uh, I'm sure he had a system down. But but uh, what do we do with this? You know, how do we apply this to our lives? Well, well, first thing, uh, you don't encourage your spouse to to be with another person in that way. Duh, right? You know, we know that. Uh, also, we see humility will diffuse a contentious or divisive situation. And so instead of getting emotional and arguing with the person, if we humble ourselves, if, if we submit uh, and just let them have their say, uh, it'll diffuse that situation. It doesn't mean you have to agree with them, uh, but you can let them have their say. And most certainly uh, what, what we see from this, what I see from this, is it's never good to try and help God keep his promises, to try and hurry God up. Uh, remember, God has that plan for your life, for my life. And if it's his plan, then it's a perfect plan, right? I mean, and, and so any deviation from that perfect plan is going to be less than perfect, uh, like we see here. And, and the result of this deviation, uh, the result was this is this 4,000 year uh, um, feud with, with countless loss of life, still going on today, still continuing because of that situation. It all started here. And so uh, if you're in a situation where, where you're going on your own direction, maybe you're, you've taken your own plan, uh, deviated a little bit rather than following God's plan, you know, just stop right where you are. Just stop and, and seek the Lord. Seek his direction. And he will have the best possible solution for the situation that you've gotten into. Uh, He has the best advice, and he would absolutely love to give it to you if you would just ask. Don't try to to get yourself out of a bad situation, because as we saw there, it just gets worse and worse and worse. You want to just stop, seek the Lord, and he will get you out of the situation. Just take it to him. That's what he's there for. That's what he wants. He loves uh, to help us because he loves us. And so he loves when we bring, uh, he doesn't, uh, you know, I'm sure he doesn't love problems, but he loves when we bring our problems to him and rely on him because he knows he's got the best answer. And so let's pray about that. Lord, we just uh, thank you. We thank you for being our God and for loving us. And, uh, and for wanting to uh, give us direction and guidance and for having a plan for our lives, Lord. And, and uh, I know every one of us, including me, we, we deviate from that plan sometimes. Maybe not in, in, in the, to the magnitude of, 
uh, of what we saw here, Lord, but we do deviate. And, and so, Lord, I just ask that you would, if there's an area that we're doing that, that we're, we're kind of going on our own way, that you would show us, reveal that to us right now, Lord, and just help us to stop and, uh, and just to, to seek your direction, Lord. And so we're asking right now, I'm asking on behalf of each one of us, that you would, would reveal that to us, Lord, that you would show us. Uh, that you would get us, get us out of a bad situation if we're in it, Lord, the best possible way that you would resolve it in us. And, Lord, so we just ask for your blessing and your guidance and your leading and, and your love, Lord. And we thank you for being our Father. And, Lord, just bless each one of us this week. Uh, watch over us. Help us uh, to get back on your plan. Help us to seek you and allow you uh, to get us back on your plan, Lord. Thank you, Father. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.